Hi, Nick. How are you? Peter, I'm great. It's great to be back. Great to have you back on the show. Okay, lots to talk about. Let me flip that down. Um, I'm going to get more into custody with you, obviously, because that's what you do. Yep. Um, and, you know, for disclosure, people know that you're a sponsor and I'm a customer, also a, a, pay, a paying customer. A paying customer. People don't believe that, by the way. Nope. They think you give me a freebie. Um, the reason I want to talk to you about this is that it's people have been raising the issue again that there is beginning to be a too high, well, maybe not even beginning, there just is a too high, high concentration of Bitcoin that's now being custodied by other parties, and that's a risk to Bitcoin. Um, and I know that's something you obviously deeply care about because yep. that's what your business is based on. <clears throat> yep. Do we know what kind of levels are being custodied? Yeah, so this is a pretty interesting analysis to do because if you look at some of the guys like Glassnode and, and some of these other on-chain analysis types of tools, they'll actually show you over the last year, you might have seen people posting these charts of the amount of Bitcoin held on exchanges going down. Problem with that is that they don't include all of the custodians. So they've got, you know, some of the major exchanges, like they'll show you like Kraken or Binance or some of Coinbase's wallet, but they're not showing you guys like BitGo or Coinbase Custody. Coinbase Custody is the side of Coinbase that actually holds all the institutional capital. So it, back in 2019, Chainalysis did this analysis that, you know, they've got a way better picture of everything going on inside these custodians because the custodians have to use Chainalysis for their uh, regulatory, you know, compliance. Well, they said up to 60% of all Bitcoin that is still not lost. So you take out the about 4 million Bitcoin that you're uh, estimating to be lost, about 60% of that remaining Bitcoin they were estimating was held by custodians. So that was in 2019. Then you look at what Coinbase has been doing, and Coinbase's public, uh, numbers are public now. So you can go on their quarterly reports and see how much Bitcoin they secure. At the end of Q3 this year, Coinbase secured over 2.5 million Bitcoin. You know, not dollars in Bitcoin, that's raw Bitcoin. And that's because Coinbase custody has, you know, this institutional buying, the institutions, the big guys who are buying billions of dollars, they can't be self-custodying. And so that's aggregating a ton of Bitcoin in to these custodians into one place. And that's a risk to the network. And it's something that people aren't taking into account as they're thinking about their own custody. Okay, so they can't custody uh, because of the framework that, that they operate under or they can't because they just don't have the ability? It depends. Um, but for the really large guys, you've actually got um, regulatory things, uh, rules that say you are you have to use a custodian. So like the super big investment funds, they're required to use a custodian. But um, some of the more medium-sized investment funds and, and companies, I think they can self-custody if they wanted to. And so th there are options that are being built for that. But this is one of those things where there's actually, it's kind of this double-edged sword to institutional adoption of Bitcoin, right? Like MicroStrategy probably isn't self-custodying their billions of dollars in Bitcoin that they've been purchasing. They've probably got this in Coinbase Custody or BitGo or something like that. And so that just puts the onus on individuals who actually are allowed to self-custody it's even more important that we get as many individuals as possible to be taking advantage of that. Okay, and when you're thinking about the amount of Bitcoin that is being custodied by third parties on behalf of other people, what are the ex existential risks to that that you're thinking about? Yeah, the big thing, there, Bitcoin really protects against two types of risks. There's inflation risk, and then there's systemic risk. And Everybody understands the inflation risk side of this, right? On the systemic risk side, what that means is that if the financial system melts down, 
what typically happens is liquidity locks up everywhere. This is what causes all the markets to crash in a, a lot of times because everybody's trying to sell at the same time their assets and you run out of liquidity and that makes the everybody keeps lowering their price to make sure that they get their sell in first, right? Mm -hmm. So everything locks up. Well, Bitcoin runs on a totally separate financial system unless you are sitting with your Bitcoin inside the existing financial system because it's held by a custodian. And so what the actual risk here is that people who have their Bitcoin investment with a custodian and any, any sort of financial meltdown, the exact time when you want to have your Bitcoin, they it's highly likely that they won't be able to access it because it's locked up. Withdrawals are suspended from this exchange or that exchange because they don't have the liquidity or because they're dealing with other problems internally. And so that's a risk for holders of Bitcoin, but it's also a risk to the network. And the reason it's a risk to a network is because it causes a loss of trust in Bitcoin as this sovereign form of money. But then it also, let's say one of these custodians that's holding a significant amount of Bitcoin makes a mistake and they accidentally disappear all their Bitcoin because they had a bug in their code or something like that. Well, that suddenly gets rid of a huge amount of Bitcoin supply. And some people might look at that and say, okay, great. You know, now my Bitcoin's <laughs> worth more. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know that that's really the case, right? Like there gets to be a point when you actually start destroying trust in the currency when those kinds of things happen. So it's too large a pool for a single point of failure. Like right. if I lose my Bitcoin, nobody's going to notice. The network wouldn't notice. If something happened in the Coinbase system, you know, that's what's that? That's just over 10% of the supply would be. Well, gone. yeah. And it's, it's even more when you look at the supply that isn't lost. So, you know, you, you assume about more yeah. like 17 million Bitcoin is, is not lost today or kind of the estimates. Yeah. So that's even more than 10% of that chunk. So it's a it's a pretty big systemic risk to the entire ecosystem. And we still have the PTSD from Mt. Gox yeah. going through another similar scenario. On a much and, bigger scale. But one of the things, because I've thought about this, I've thought about something like Coinbase custody and so much Bitcoin, or, you know, Kraken or Gemini. And, and I've often thought, what if there was... What is this bug? There could be a bug that causes you know, a load of Bitcoin to be wiped out. But are we? I would assume now, if a Coinbase to be custodying two point five million Bitcoin, we must be at the point where they are beyond that type of risk. Yeah. So they're a highly professional institution. It is a very low percentage risk that that kind of bug or something like that happens. So. I'm not trying to spread FUD mm. by saying that's imminent. But, you know, earlier this year, maybe it was last year, I don't know, one of the major banks, I think it was Citi, accidentally, you know, wired somebody $700 million or something like that. I, I, I'm having trouble remembering mm -hmm. this, this article, but one of these banks made a mistake where they blew a ton of money off into the wire system, into space, basically, and we're trying to claw it back, and they were having trouble with it and all this. And, and so these big corporations aren't infallible. And maybe it's something that happens once every 10 years or something like that. But when you're talking about something as critical as a money that's trying to be the money for the world, the base currency of the entire world, and you have these types of risks, you want to account for them because those tail risk events are the things that blow everything up. Yeah, bugs, code bugs, and immutability are not a great marriage. Yeah. And so that's why the, the way that you protect against that, because software is going to have bugs, right? The way you protect against that is by having as much Bitcoin distributed into individual wallets as possible. Because like you said, if you lose your Bitcoin, it's not that big of a deal. It is to me, but not the network. Right. So that, that's network protection. Right. But then I also think as an individual, I mean, I use your service, which I love yeah. and tell everyone that they should have if they've got uh, enough Bitcoin. But you also are a company that writes code and builds software. And yep. if there was a bug in yours, something similar could happen. Yeah. Like, how much does that weigh on you and the team? And it, I'd love to know 
what kind like as much as you can tell me what kind of goes into your own bug testing i interviewed uh, we had austin hill in here the other day and he talked about uh, bitcoin developers and uh, code reviews he said it's a bit like nasa for every 100 hours of code there's 900 hours of review and similar for uh, nuclear scientists and he said bitcoin needs the same yeah you know, it's it needs the same level of um, uh, a kind of code review and 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 due diligence. But what what is it like for Casa with this? Yeah, I mean, Casa protects a lot of Bitcoin, and so we take that super seriously. And so we were actually I, I was just talking with one of our backend developers, Stacy, who's super good at writing uh, the Bitcoin code that Casa relies on, and. We um, have a couple of things in place that really help protect against this. And these are things that every company should, right? But it, every company that's building on Bitcoin, on the, the security and wallet side of things. But you've got really intense code review anytime something is touching the Bitcoin part. So anytime you're talking about generating addresses or sending funds or you know creating a multi-sig, using keys, you put an immense amount of scrutiny on that code. And then you're testing every single possible permutation of this, right? So we have a lot of internal processes in place that we really spend a lot of time because for our business, one mistake like that can just totally wreck our reputation. Yeah, you can be done. It's a risk to the business that we have to manage for. And that's why we hire the best people and put these processes in place. Now, what's kind of nice about the way that CASA works, though, is that if you've got, you're using our multi-sig, you've got a, a ledger and a trezor or in the cold card as part of your multi-sig, each of their hardware is double-checking everything that CASA is doing. And so that actually lets you have some checks and balances that CASA has no control over. So if something was going wrong in what CASA was doing, these other guys can, in some scenarios, help flag that and help save people from losing money. That's part of the security model of what we've built. And so therefore, as we talk about, you know, Ethereum people talk about move fast, break things, which I think is a very dumb uh, attitude to have when you're talking about immutable. Sovereign say, money. Well, monies. I mean, I think Bitcoin is sovereign money. These are other things, but yeah. you know, they have value. Um, so Bitcoin really is like, Move, sl move slow, don't break things. Yeah, But just as the core devs have to work with that kind of attitude, all the companies building on top have to have a similar attitude. Right. Yeah, everybody's got to be careful. And they, they, you can't move fast and break things in certain areas. Maybe some companies who aren't necessarily touching as much like high-value Bitcoin can move fast and break things or ship code that isn't as well vetted. But for Casa, even, I mean, even outside of the core security stuff, we everything we ship, we want it to be extremely high quality. Because if you've got a typo or something in the app where you're, you know, somebody it's during a couple of instruction screens and there's a typo there, that gives people a little bit of doubt about how much work you're putting into the security side, even if you put mm. a, a way more work into the security side, right? So we as a company try to be as close to flawless in everything that we put out because that's just part of our reputation. It's it's what we want to be known for. We want to be known as an incredibly trustworthy company, and, and that's you know that's part of it. And what about the devs themselves? Because you wouldn't want an individual developer to be able to put some erroneous code in there, which meant yeah. you could send the Bitcoin out. So I guess you have to have people checking people's work and checkers checking the checkers. Yeah, that's we've got multiple layers of that, right? So every time somebody's putting out code, you've got multiple other people reviewing their code. And then you've got, once it actually goes to the test app, we've got a test version of the app. And you've got multiple people testing that before it goes to the app store, that kind of stuff. And so you do have checks and checks and checks to make sure that this stuff goes right. And you don't run into one of those bugs that could be real game-breaking bug for you. Yeah, God, honestly, that keep me <laughs> keep me up at night, Nick. But it's the kind of thing that we handle so that you don't have to be up at night. That's yeah, what, no, no, that's no, what no. we hear all the time, right? I just it just is 
this immutable world that we're having to get used used to is it's great while it works, but it you just have to be very thankful all across the Bitcoin ecosystem that people are are this diligent about it yeah. because there is there is you know to lose all your Bitcoin could be devastating. Yep. Just going back to the um, kind of more like existential risk to Bitcoin of too much being custody by uh, custodians. You talk then about you know, systemic risk and reputational risk to Bitcoin if there was some kind of error there where a large amount of Bitcoin was lost. But what about the other scenario? Do you, some Bitcoiners talk about, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. One of the reasons you don't want large uh, amounts of Bitcoin custody it is if there was ever a scenario where there was a very fast regulatory crackdown, yeah. could could the USG, if they want to do, although I think we're far away from that, but just could they, for example, say, Coinbase, you have to switch off access to your wallets now. Or I think a rarer scenario, but isn't without precedent, is confiscation. Yeah. So this is something that you can, I agree with you that it, it doesn't feel like we are we are headed towards this, honestly, mm -hmm. but it's more of an open door when you've got a bunch of Bitcoin sitting in custodians. If you look all the way back to when the U.S. did the Order 6102 that mm -hmm. confiscated people's gold all the way back in like the 30s, I think it was, uh, the reason that was possible was because most gold was stored in banks. And so th the U.S. government just had to go around to the banks and say, turn over the gold in your vaults, we'll pay you out in dollars at this market price that we're setting. And that was that. If they'd had to go around and knock on every single person's door and say, hey, turn over your gold, that just wouldn't work. It, the, the government, while they seem all powerful, they're not that efficient. Plus, if you know it's coming, you can hide it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I lost my keys in a boating accident. <laughs> I lost my gold in a boating accident. Yeah. And so, that's, so um, that risk is much larger when you have all the Bitcoin in a custodian. But when, when you have a ton of people self-custodying and you've got um, a, very, a, a way more distributed network from a holder's perspective, that's just much a much more resilient network, and it's much more difficult for somebody to try and do that. And actually, you look at this in countries where maybe there isn't as much rule of law as what you would expect from the U.S., and it's potentially an even bigger deal there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that you, you know I think it's it's important around the world for people to be to be paying attention to self custody. Yeah, right. whilst I don't think U.S. citizens are at any risk for having their Bitcoin confiscated by the USG right now, and probably not for some time or ever, yeah. uh, I would have less confidence in more rogue states or right. more states who maybe are having some kind of financial collapse. I mean, in Venezuela, Maduro's uh, henchmen went and stole the mining equipment for the people mining, and yeah. people had to flee the country. And yeah, would I put it to... Or, would I put it beyond someone like Erdogan to confiscate Bitcoin if the uh, uh, Turkish con economy collapsed? I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm out yeah. of my depth there. But well, and, and there's there's historical precedent for this. If you look back to Argentina uh, a couple decades ago, they actually people in Argentina um, had U.S. dollar bank accounts because they were using that to protect against inflation from the Argentinian dollar, and Argentina actually went in and took the U.S. dollars, converted them because it was in everybody's bank account, and that was that. Now everybody holds the national currency as they're supposed to. The 40% inflation yeah. national currency. Do we know much about the operations or the protections these large custodians put in place themselves? Um, again, I mean, I have no idea how yeah. the key setup would work. It's someone like Casa. How many keys they would have, who would have access to them, how distributed they are themselves, the rules and procedures they have. Do they do they put in protection themselves to protect their customers' funds from any potential government action? I, these are the things I've got no idea how it works. Well, in the unfortunate part, which it, you know you can't get around it, is that they're not going to publicize that information, no, and I course, wouldn't yeah. want them to publicize that information. But what most of them are using is something very like multi-sig, where mm -hmm. they've got multiple keys, 
that are protecting their cold storage funds. And then they've also got some of the, the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that they you know let people trade in a hot wallet so that people can withdraw faster. The most professional exchanges like Coinbase know what they're doing. They've got a bunch of processes in place and we hope that they, they've taken the right precautions. But you've also got some of the smaller to mid-sized exchanges like Quadriga yep. that you think they're doing that. And then, oh, it turns out the guy's got it on his ledger and he's been trading with it and then he disappears. And so you have to be died. Yeah. He died. And so you have to be uh you have to be a little bit careful about if you're gonna be using a custodian, who are you choosing to use here? And honestly, if you're an individual, you really should have most of your holdings in self custody. I think people used to uh, sometimes I'll see people say, even even today actually, you know, holding your own keys is just too hard for some of the new people to the space. And it's okay to hold your your uh, funds on Coinbase because you don't want to have to worry about managing the keys. But that was really something that only was true four years ago. The software that has evolved, including Casa, to let even people holding $100 a Bitcoin store it super easily while holding their own keys is light years better than where it used to be. It feels like you're using an exchange. You don't have to worry about losing the key because it's been encrypted and backed up to the cloud. So if you lose your phone, you just get a new phone and log in and you're good. What if the cloud's hacked? Well, that's why you have to have the right setups, right? So you need to take a couple of things into account there. But the way that Casa does it, as an example, is your key, your private key, is only ever on your phone. But you can encrypt it, and we handle this in the background with a key from Casa, and then upload it to your iCloud or your Google Drive. And that way, you actually need access to both accounts in order to get that key. And so that adds this layer of difficulty. And then the next stage is, okay, you don't want to keep that much money in that key. So that's like, how much money would you keep in your wallet? That's how much you keep there. Yeah. And if you lose it because something happened, that sucks, but it's not the end of the world. And so somebody just getting started in Bitcoin, though, they've bought their first $100 of Bitcoin, that's perfect for, and they're getting started holding their own keys. And then once they're getting above a thousand, couple thousand where it's really getting meaningful, you have the ability to to add security by adding in a hardware wallet, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, th- I think what it is, Nick, I think some people get nervous about something they don't really understand Yeah, and maybe put it off until they try it. Uh, I mean, I remember I got my first ledger back in 2017, <laughs> as the ad says. Uh, when I got my first ledger back in 2017, um, when I first got it, I was nervous. It's intimidating. It is intimidating. It's something new. And you know, I'd backed up my private key. You know, I wrote it down in a couple of places. and you know, But that first time I sent Bitcoin to it, I was nervous. And I, I still didn't send most of it. And it just took some time to get my head around. It was a bit like multisig. I put off getting multisig for about a year until yeah. I reached out to you and said, like, finally, I'm going to do it. But even after that, going going through the process of actually completing it, distributing the keys, that still took some time. I was still a bit nervous. I still am a bit nervous, but I'm technically competent enough to do something like that. I'm telling you now, my dad, no chance. He can't work a remote control. Yeah. Yeah, and so there's we actually have people that, that are kind of along those lines using our product, and sometimes they've got family members that help them, but other times they've got our client service team that's helping them, right? That's why we have them. Mm. But I totally agree that private key using private keys has been uh, too difficult over the, the, the history of, of Bitcoin. And so it's really important that companies like Casa are working super hard to make this easier for people because it really is, like we were saying earlier, it's really important that people are able to do this and that they're able to do it in a safe way. So things like your seed phrase, I think that kind of stuff is going away. Like I, I think we're getting to a point where uh, 10 years from now, nobody's writing down, unless you're a, a super technical I want to do everything myself 
from scratch. Nobody's messing with seed phrase anymore. I only have a seed phrase for one of my Casa keys, and I've been thinking of dump like a backup, and I think I've been dump. I've, I've been thinking of dumping it. Yeah, uh, and it's the the reason with Casa and with other like multi sig setups like this, you don't need the seed phrase, is because if you lose that key, you just replace it. Mm-hmm. You don't need to recover that key at all costs, and so that's just a big game changer in how people manage keys, and it lets you be a human. Let's you make mistakes, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's um, it's su- super interesting talking to this. I always talk to friends about this. Always a good sounding board, and I've got some people that bit. We've got Bitcoin, and some are still holding it on something like Coinbase. Yeah, some have a hardware wallet. Uh, I'm the only one who's got to multi sig. Um, what's your experience with you know new customers coming in? Because I'm assuming some people them. They might be really green when they come into you, like very new to Bitcoin. But someone said, "Look, you're buying this much. You need multi sig." Yeah. Like, is it a tough like learning journey for these people? Not really. Um, so what what actually what we see is a lot of people have this idea of multi sig as something that's super complicated. So they're saying, "Okay, this word multi sig." is already blowing my mind. Yeah. And I am just getting started using a hardware wallet. I don't feel comfortable moving to multi-sig yet. Actually, so so where that puts multi- CASA and kind of multi-sig is like you've maybe got your Coinbase all the way on one end of the spectrum, and then you've got kind of your single signature hardware wallet in the middle, and then you've got multi-sig all the way on the other end if you're talking about how difficult it is to use. But actually when people come and try the product, they realize it's kind of flipped. And CASA is more of this in-betweener where on that spectrum where it sits more in the middle because you've got the CASA software helping you through every step. You've got the CASA support team there to help you through every step. And at our higher tiers, you've got people getting on the phone with you and actually walking you through this stuff, right? And so this makes it much more approachable than simply getting a ledger and going and watching some YouTube videos about how to set this thing up. And that's really the anxiety-inducing side of things. And so we have many customers that are coming off of Coinbase for the first time. They bought some, bought some Bitcoin on Coinbase. They've held it there for a few years. It's suddenly worth a lot more. And they only feel comfortable self-custodying because CASA exists. The thing people don't really realize, I think, about the risks, this is another risk of Coinbase So we, we and, and other exchanges. We were talking about all of Stop these. Stop picking on Coinbase. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Brian. Sorry, Brian. Stop sending shit coins, Brian. <laughs> we were talking about the more the systemic risk, like what happens if Coinbase loses all 2.5 million of their Bitcoin, right? That would suck. That would suck. Very low likelihood, like we were saying. But what is much higher likelihood is the risk of your individual account on Coinbase getting hacked. And we've seen that's happened yeah, multiple times talks. over the yeah. last few months, thousands of customer accounts getting hacked. Oh, hold on. I don't know. Have I just missed this? Yeah, there was, uh, there was an article in CNBC back in August. There was an article in Reuters in September. Okay. Two different incidents talking about thousands of customer accounts getting hacked because they had weak two-factor authentication on them. And the thing with using a custodian for your Bitcoin, the reason it doesn't work is that Bitcoin transactions are irreversible. You can use a custodian for your dollars because if somebody hacks your account or gets your credit card, you just tell your bank to put the money back and they can usually go track it down for you. With Bitcoin, somebody gets access to your exchange account, it's gone. And there, there's really no recourse. And so all of the endpoints end up being the points of failure with, with these exchanges. And they become big honeypots because people know that if they can find some vulnerability, like the 2FA vulnerability, and then go run a bunch of a password dump from somewhere else on the, the internet and just see what accounts they can get into... Well, that's you know, that's a, a much bigger, more real risk to individuals. People have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars because of that. And so 
when you are holding your own keys, let's say somebody gets access to your CASA account, they got nothing because the key is on your device or the key is on your device plus a hardware wallet or three other hardware wallets. And so it's just a, a significantly safer system. And people are starting to realize this more and more. And even Coinbase themselves are, are seeing this. Like They are seeing the, fact, the, the writing on the wall that custodians don't scale to a massive amount of individuals in uh, Bitcoin. Coinbase, Brian was on a, another podcast like a month ago saying self-custody is Coinbase's number one priority. And so hmm. the custodians see that the writing's on the wall here. And I'm glad that Coinbase is starting to prioritize some of this stuff because they do have such a massive customer base. And I hope this helps like decentralize the the holdings on the Bitcoin network more. What did Brian say why that was the number one issue for them? Uh, so he didn't so he said it was the number one issue, you know, because it allows them to be more flexible around like moving into things like DeFi and that kind of thing. But I'd be willing to guess that there's a big piece of this that underlies it as well, which is the security model just does not work in Bitcoin. And so that's something that um, I, I think they're really thinking about. Interesting. Um, is there enough competition in the market, uh, both with multi-sig solutions being provided? And, uh, you obviously don't want competition, but I think competition is good. I think we all know competition is good. But is there enough competition for multi-sig provision and also within hardware wallets? Uh, I use the main three of Cold Card, Trezor, and Ledger. Um, I know Blockstream have got a, a hardware wallet. I know that um, Jack Dorsey's talking about doing one. Um, or is that actually even problematic for you because you would have to support so many different ones? And How do you feel about that? We like having the diversity of hardware wallets that we can integrate and... There's a ton. There's way more hardware wallets. There's lots than of you smaller think. ones. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, they all send um, me them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we make sure we basically, in order to integrate a hardware wallet, we got to vet it. It needs to be something that's easy to use. They need to have a, a decent sized kind of user base to prove that they've been doing this for a while and they're a secure device. And so having more hardware to integrate, I think, is is always good. And having competition there, in seeing somebody like Square come in, who we know is good at building hardware, that is only good, you know, it can only be a good thing for the Bitcoin user experience, which is great. And the same thing goes for the software wallet side of things and, and some of the things that Casa is doing. You know, as we see competition in the space and other people pushing the same, for the same goals that Casa is, which is help more people self-custody protect the Bitcoin network, give people their personal sovereignty. These things are, um, you know, they're, they're important goals that's going to take more than just CASA working on it. And so we like seeing other people working towards those same, same goals. Are you supporting any other hardware devices beyond those three? Yeah, so today we've got, um, so like you said, Trezor, Ledger, Cold Card. And then we also support Keystone, which okay. is relatively new. That one's interesting because it's it's got a screen and it's a QR code wallet, right? And Keystone. so, yeah. Want to have a look? And so you can actually, um, typically with the Trezor Ledger cold card side of things, you need a computer mm -hmm. to sign a transaction. With the Keystone, you are actually able to to do it all from the phone. Yeah. So you can scan the QR code on from the phone to the Keystone pass a, a transaction that's going to be signed. The Keystone signs the transaction. You scan the QR code again to send it back to your phone, and it all happens just between those two devices. I think we'll start to see more of these coming, more of these types of wallets coming out and being developed, and that helps build a better user experience, more of a mobile-friendly user experience around these things. So in terms of institutions self-custody in, how do you th how do you think we get more of them to do it? Because it feels like they they will have been explained the risk, yeah. will understand the risk. Yeah, 
they're still taking the risk. And let's forget about the ones who have some kind of like regulatory reason they can't. How do how do we do is it is it the responsibility for everyone in the community to be doing this? Do you think do you think the people who are pushing for self custody of have kind of been lost in the kind of this growth of Bitcoin becoming this institutional asset, you know, like a micro strategy, as we probably would guess. Right. Probably don't have a, right. a Casa Multisig. And do you think that perhaps the institutionalization of Bitcoin has maybe kind of, I don't know, harmed some of the principles on which Bitcoin should be built? I think it's a tough question that it's. It's hard to say because as you see Bitcoin get more institutionalized and more roped into the existing system, you start to lose some of those benefits of Bitcoin. And, you know, I, I don't want to be saying micro strategies doing a bad thing, right? Like they're out there really educating people about Bitcoin. They're helping institutions who also need the same types of inflation protection that individuals do. So you don't want to cut them out, right? So it's it's like, how can we do this in a way that makes it so it's still sustainable for the Bitcoin network? And I think where part of that comes in are, are the smaller and, and medium-sized businesses. They're self-custodying their Bitcoin. And they're doing it in a way that is safe. You know, they're using a multi-sig. Maybe they're handing keys to different partners uh, in the business. We have businesses that use Casa that do that today. And so there are some pretty interesting ways to actually manage a business treasury as a team and as a, as a business that is self-custodying. I think that it's going to come, but it's going to take some time and some education, right? A lot of businesses are already taking this big leap just to put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. And then you ask them to self-custody and they're thinking about things like fiduciary duty, and can I get sued by my investors if I accidentally lose this Bitcoin due to making a mistake? That kind of stuff. They need to work through that. But as they're working through that and understanding, it's even for them, uh, it's important to protect the Bitcoin network because that protects their own Bitcoin investment. So as they understand that and they understand why self-custody helps them do that, I think we'll start to see more people shifting on the business side. But I just I see it as more of a, a lag compared to individuals who can do make those types of decisions much faster. Mm. The other thing that I think is going to be interesting to see is as Bitcoin tr- makes the transition from just this um, digital gold store of value that you stick somewhere and don't touch to more of a medium of exchange, unit of account, more of a base layer for parts of the internet, Suddenly, you're you're using Bitcoin as this more decentralized settlement layer, right? Well, you're paying minor fees to do that. You're paying more fees as as a user, as a business. Um, if you're using apps that are built on Bitcoin, those are going to be more expensive than a typical centralized app running in a database, whatever. These things are they don't make sense if you aren't self-custodying. Because why would you want to pay more for the network fees, et cetera, if you're just going to have it all running through a financial institution in the first place? Mm. And so as we start to see Bitcoin make this transition from digital gold store of value that doesn't move to something that, yes, you've got a chunk of it that's acting as that Azure savings for you, but you've also got some of it moving around and uh, you're utilizing it in your day-to-day life, it really, the the logic doesn't make sense unless you are self-custodying and taking advantage of those benefits that self-custody gives you. Interesting. And if you look back at the, the, the white paper, very first sentence of the white paper says that Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer electronic cash system that can allow people to send payments without going through financial institutions. That's the first sentence is around built around self-custody, not around inflation protection, not around digital gold. What about self-custody for emerging markets? We obviously have this year had the big story of El Salvador yeah. becoming a Bitcoin nation. Um, 
hundred dollars of Bitcoin might be a huge amount of money to somebody, or even a few hundred dollars of Bitcoin. Right. But there is a risk they don't have the technical skills to set up their own multi-sig or can't afford a multi-sig service. Also, logistically, based on some of the places I've been in El Salvador, the thought of somebody creating a multi-sig and saying, oh, And distributing wallets where, and where stuff. Where am I going to distribute these? Right. It's not like they have access to a... Um, Safety deposit box, and you know, to be honest, some of these houses aren't, and they don't have the kind of security that maybe people in the West have. Yeah, is much thought going into uh, security for emerging markets as well? Yeah, so there's um, there's a few different people and companies that are working on things like this. So there's actually a company, I might mispronounce the name. I apologize. Galoy, G A L O Y. They're doing a multi sig based system where it's actually a community wallet. Interesting. And so it's at El Zante in El Salvador, and everybody is pooling their Bitcoin into this community multi-sig wallet. And instead of having you know necessarily a bunch of ledgers and treasures for each individual person, there's generally somebody in the community who is leading this effort and is making sure that they're keeping people's Bitcoin secure for them. And so this is just a different approach for a different culture and a different set of needs, exactly like you were saying. So it's like almost like a bank. Yeah, well, Bitcoin banking infrastructure for communities and institutions. Right. Offering financial services on Bitcoin and Lightning is made easy with the open source software from Galoy. Yeah, and so I think they're doing some really interesting things. And that this goes back to what I was saying where it, it kind of takes a, an army to – really build this in a way that everybody around the world can self-custody their Bitcoin. You know, one company alone can't do this, but it's critical that we're all working towards it because that's what the network needs. And so you're going to need, in places like El Salvador, where they may only have 50 bucks of Bitcoin and can't pay a $5 on-chain transaction fee every time they send money, you need lightning integration. You aren't going to be able to have a, a distributed multi-sig that somebody is paying for every year. You want a shared community multi-sig. I think people are going to come up with these interesting ways to build this. And what's so exciting about that is that Bitcoin itself is a permissionless open network. And being able to tie into that network through self-custody so that anybody can participate, there are no gatekeepers, that's one of the huge innovations of Bitcoin. And anytime you've had these more open um, ecosystems or networks or economies, immense value has been created. So you look back to when the US was created, it was relatively, compared to other countries in the world, one of the most open and, and capitalistic economies in the world, very permissionless relative to the others. And so that set the U.S. on this course to be such a powerhouse of an economy today. You look at that for Bitcoin and compare it to other monetary networks that are more closed and don't have as much of the ability to just plug in and innovate from anywhere in the world. The writing is on the wall. Bitcoin, if it maintains that permissionless nature and really leans into that, huge value will be created. Can I tell you a feature I want for a wallet? Yeah. I wonder what you'll think about this. So I don't often move much Bitcoin around, but even moving $10,000 of Bitcoin, I'm always a bit like, oh, fuck, what if I get this wrong? I'm always slightly nervous about it. Yeah, I want totally. uh, something in my uh, uh, wallet where I have a different uh, send button, whereby what it does is it sends, you create the send, and it just sends 10 bucks first. And you can check it's got them. Once you've checked, you say send the rest. I know it sounds pathetic, but every time I'm like, no, you're all, it's always nerve wracking. Yeah. You're like quadruple checking an address and everything. And it's, and I've never got one wrong yeah. in the history of Bitcoin. And every time it's been a, you know, a copy, control C, control V, and it's worked, but I always panic. And if I was ever going to send a huge amount, I'd love to be able to just, you just send $10 first. So you can, you can confirm it there. Yeah. It depends on your, your setup. Like some setups, that's really easy. If it's just, coming from a single key on your phone, right? Yeah. That you, That's super simple to build. But if you're trying to do it with a, a multi-sig, that gets a little more complicated because that's actually two transactions mm -hmm. for, from Bitcoin Network's perspective. And so then you're adding signatures from each key twice. 
And if you got those That's distributed that. around the every geographically, that just adds a whole All other right. loop. All right, it's a pain. It's a pain. Listen, you told me uh, you told me sub accounts would be too difficult. We got it done. You though. got it done. <laughs> if, are you planning to do anything with Lightning? And, and I, you know what? It's one of these stupid questions. Where people are like you're a fucking idiot, Pete. But like, is that is multi sig a thing with Lightning? Do people use multi sig for Lightning? So. Um, Lightning actually uses multi-sigs in, in, kind of in the background to open yeah. channels. Yes. But uh, multi-sig on Lightning to like send Lightning funds, as far as I know, it's not a thing. Maybe, okay. I, I'm not a Bitcoin protocol engineer, so I, I could be wrong. Maybe there's something in the works that's going to allow this. But right now, that's not a thing. Um, however, Casa has a history with Lightning. You know, we used to have the Casa node, mm -hmm, and you could. We were one of the first really, the node. actually easy, somewhat easy ways to use Lightning. Uh, we will definitely get back to that. I mean, it's been great to see not the Casa node. Sorry, uh. just to clarify, um, but we will get back to offering Lightning functionality. What do you people. think of bringing? Can you say? What do you mean? Well, what, what functionality are you thinking of bringing in? Oh, making it super simple for people to send and receive over Lightning. Right. Okay. I think that's one of the things that we're starting to see in your more, light wallet. Yeah. Yeah. We're starting to see more people want that. It makes sense. From, you know, right now we've got the within the Casa app the free single mobile wallet, and if that was really easy to also send from Lightning over that, I think that's great. There's some things that you have to figure out actually on the the custody side with that though, because due to some of the technical stuff around Lightning that I won't get into. It gets um, it's much easier to have it be custodial than non-custodial, and so some of the mm -hmm. the really simple mobile Lightning wallets today, like Strike or um, I think Wallet of Satoshi might might be one of these. They're actually custodial Lightning wallets. Blue wallets are custodial. Um, I think it's kind of like semi-custodial in a weird way. Some of the other ones like. Blue Wallet and Moon Wallet, these are in a little bit of a gray area uh, around whether they're custodial or not. They have like custodial pieces to it, basically. Okay. But anyway, we would really love to build a amazing, simple user experience around Lightning that still maintains as much of the non-custodial angle to it as possible because that lets more people around the world use it, right? It mm -hmm. lets anybody in Latin America sign up for CASA and use it rather than us having to worry about, oh, we don't have the right licenses in whatever country that people want to use this in. So um, that's one of the, you know, those are some of the benefits of self-custody that we haven't even talked about. But we would love to bring back a Lightning feature, and it's something that um, as we've seen the Lightning Network grow so much over the last year, and some of the exciting things that are getting built there, some of the really exciting integrations like Twitter integrating Lightning, it's starting to become something that we're hearing from customers more and want to add back into the product. Interesting. How long have you been at Casa now? Is it two years? Three. Three years now. Almost four. Damn. Casa in its current iteration was started in, at really the beginning of 2018, like end of 2017. Yes, I remember. And I joined in March or April of 2018. How long have you been in the hot seat? Since December 2019. Yeah, so about two years. Yep. Yeah, I thought so. Yep. How you found it? It's amazing. I mean, it's the it's totally different than I expected, right? right. Like, even being an employee at Casa as head of product before I took over as CEO, I thought I knew what it might be like to be the CEO of a company, and then you actually do it, and it's just it's totally different. It's just a different level of responsibility that you just didn't really realize was there. But I love it because it's actually like, it's not like I'm some hero doing all this work, right? Mm -hmm. Like I get to see all the amazing stuff that our team is doing, and we're hiring people. We've grown to over 30 people now, and all of the new people that have been joining our team are just awesome and they're not they're not all people who have just been in bitcoin forever they're people who have been wanting to get into bitcoin because they learned about it during the pandemic and decided they wanted to give up whatever they were doing and start working in bitcoin and they come on and they're so excited to be working at casa and the things that they can do are amazing 
you get to be like Steve Jobs. You just go around yelling at people what you want and then take the credit. I would like to think that I'm a nicer version of Steve Jobs <laughs> and that I don't take as much credit. <laughs> Do you feel pressure with it? With with what? Being a CEO. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's times when, you know, I'll wake up in the middle. This actually happened more like a, a few months ago or I've I've kind of fixed this. I'll get to that in a second. There's times when I would wake up in the middle of the night and just be spinning through my to-do list yeah, in my head. I like, know that feeling. And just stress, right? Because of the weight of responsibility to make Casa a successful company, but also to accomplish our, our mission. And then what I've kind of figured out was I could change my perspective on that a bit and just realize the fact that these are the fun parts of building a business. Uh -huh. The challenges that you can either look at them as these anxiety-inducing, stress-inducing problems, or you can look at them as challenges to overcome. And that makes it more exciting because you're learning and growing and getting to solve new things. And I just realized if I wasn't doing this, I mean, let's say I was back working at some bank or something like that, like I'd be seeking this out anyway. I was talking to uh, Jamie Leverton from Heart 18 this morning with uh, Amanda Fabiano from Galaxy. And yeah. We, she was talking about, because she's been in the, the seat at Heart 8 for about a year. She says, yeah, basically I just don't sleep anymore. <laughs> I have a slightly different thing. I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night just with an idea. I just wake up with it and like an idea comes to me and I, it might be like three in the morning and I yeah. want to work on it. Yeah. Like I don't want to sleep. I want to work. I I honestly think we're all, all of us are really fortunate to work in this. Yeah, it's, we are. Feel like we're all part of changing, changing part of the world. Like, and maybe end up. It could be this huge thing, or just be this thing that a, a bunch of us nerds, a couple hundred million people around the world use. But just to be in it, creating yeah. part of it. I don't know about you. I, we're I lucky. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do anything else. And even saying only a couple hundred million people around yeah. the world is pretty insane. But it, on the sleep thing, I gotta say this because I think it's a. I think there's a, a lot of uh, people in the startup world that are like, oh, I, I never sleep. That's actually really bad for you. Oh, no, I know. <laughs> I know that. And I've been getting better. I actually, I, I'm ruthless about this. I get eight hours of sleep a, as much as possible or more every night. Do you just sleep through and just wake up eight hours later? Well, it depends on, like, like I said, a few months ago, I, I wasn't doing that. But actually now I'm back to doing that. I have, I've never slept a solid eight hours out waking up, unless I was blind drunk. I've never, I haven't done that in years. I always wake up like a couple of times. Do you wake up? Yeah. I wake up a couple of times a night. And just, I, I mean, I'll, I'll wake up, you know, but it's like a five minute thing and then you kind of roll over. I fall back asleep. I've always been a, a decently good Oh, so sleeper. you don't like then pick up your phone, check the Bitcoin No, price. well, picking up your phone is what ruins you and keeps you from going back to sleep. Play a few levels of Angry Birds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but eight, eight hours of sleep is like this magic number for, yeah. for humans. And um, it's something that makes your decision-making much better, puts you in a much better mood. Anyway. Yeah, I know. I've been taking sleep gummies, CBD sleep gummies. Yeah? Mm -hmm. been I haven't tried those before. Brilliant. Made, made a huge difference. I don't know That's why, good. but they just made a huge difference. And it's and better than like an Ambien or something. Yeah, I, I, we don't have those in the UK. I mean, I'm, I don't want sleeping pills, but these sleep gummies work great. Just yeah. Drift off in a happy little sleep. And there I also go. started taking magnesium at one point, having the weirdest dreams. If you ever want weird dreams, take magnesium before you go to bed. Hmm. You can have the weirdest dreams. Not melatonin. You mean no, magnesium? No, magnesium. Yeah. Definitely magnesium. Weird dreams. Some of them are amazing. So, so what's coming up, Nick? <laughs> what can we look forward to, man? It's all about self-custody and continues to be about self-custody. And how can we make this as simple as possible and bring as many people as possible into holding their own keys? But um, beyond that, you know, we're starting to get asked for other things by our customers. And like one of the big things that people are starting to ask for is uh, financial services. Okay. So they're saying, hey, I've got a bunch of my Bitcoin sitting with Casa, and then I've got some of my Bitcoin with this other, you know, name your lender or borrowing company in the industry because Casa doesn't offer the ability to borrow against my Bitcoin or to lend out my Bitcoin. And so we are 
that, you know, we're bringing that in house where people can do all of that from within Casa. Mm -hmm. They can manage that there. And it's just much more convenient. Casa is meant to be you know, the home for your keys, right? Mm -hmm. And so giving people the ability to build their security portfolio and their financial portfolio within all in one place within the Casa app just adds this level of convenience. So you can have your three of five multi-sig, you can have your Bitcoin collateral account that you're borrowing dollars against because you wanted to go build your Bitcoin Citadel without selling Bitcoin. You can have your Lightning wallet, hot wallet on the phone. And so all of these things can be within the same place because it's the best, you know, it's the place that you want to manage your keys. You're building a bank. You're building a you're building a sovereign bank We're, with high grade uh, custody. Casa's not the bank, though. You're the bank. Yeah. Okay. And we're just letting you be that bank in an you, easy way. Right? You're allowing me to be my own bank. Yeah. Interesting. And you can do that's that's the dream, right? Yeah. Give you all of the services that a bank has today, but give you more control over it. Let you be the one who decides where your money goes. You know, your money in it. If if you don't want your money being lent out because you you don't you don't have to have that. You don't want to take that risk. You don't have to. And so you keep that in your cold storage multisig. You want to lend out a little piece of it because you're getting an interest rate from BlockFi or whoever. You do that. And you can manage it all in one place. Interesting. Huh. Well, congratulations, man. Thanks. It's, uh, it's been great to get to know you over, the, over this last couple of years. I, I love what you've done and how you've shaped the company since you took it over. Uh, I think Cars is a great product. I will wax lyrical as an ad read, but I'd wax lyrical with you here. Um, I, I wanted you on, not because you're a sponsor, but I also agree people should self-custody. And like I say, it took me about a year from the point of wanting to multi-sig till I actually phoned you and said, Nick, it's, uh, it's about time. And even then, once I did it, I, to actually then do the setup, to actually go through the process. And then, and then once I had it set up, then to actually transfer the Bitcoin and then move the keys because I was like, it just all felt a lot. And then by the time I did, I was like, this is so fucking easy. Yeah. That everyone should do it. So I fully support you that people should self-custody. And uh, I wish you all the best. I, I hope Carter is a huge success. And I appreciate you as a friend and a sponsor. Thanks, Peter. I've enjoyed watching the show, being on the show over the years. You've done a great job with it. And can't wait to see what you do with the football team. Oh, yes. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that soon. All right, man. Well, listen, uh, tell, tell people where to go. Keys.casa. Keys.casa is the website. Tried to buy Casa.com. Let me tell you, it's owned by Amazon. Motherfuckers. Yeah. Can you not do that thing where it's because have you got the brand? Have you got the um, trademark? Yeah. Can you not force it out? What are they using it for? They're not. It's a dead website. But it's like, we were looking into it a little bit. And I, thought, I thought under trademarks, because like, didn't Madonna force hers off somebody at one point? I don't point? know. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. But I, I think that they own it free and clear. And from what we were looking into, we, we can't do it in, unless we want to be offering minimum seven figures. <sighs> it's crazy. I always like keys.castle, though. It's, it's fun. I know where you want castle.com. Yeah. Have you got any of the other ones like castle.io or castle.co? Or... Uh, we've looked at them, and it's kind of like keys.casa has this underlying meaning to it that we really like. Keys and so if we were going to gonna switch, we'd switch to casa.com, but if we can't get casa.com, we might as well stick to our roots. You've not spoken to Jeff? Jeff. Bezos. Oh. Actually, he's not in charge anymore, is he? No, he's not. Hmm. I'll write him a letter. Write him a letter. Well, listen, look, have a great Christmas. Have a great New Year. Thank you for everything. And yeah, good luck in 2022. It's going to be a big year for you. Thanks, Peter.